All right, everyone, welcome back to Unquestionable with Calvin Smith. I've got an awesome guest here with you today. I've got Mr. Well, I should say Dr. Mark Carlotto. How are you doing? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm fantastic. I'm really happy to have you here. Uh, now, if I'm not mistaken, Mr. Uh, Carlotto, you're a aerospace engineer, if I'm not mistaken. Is that correct? Uh, my background is actually in electrical engineering, but I work in the aerospace industry. Yes, yes, that's correct. Amazing. Um, I actually found your work recently. I uh, listened to another podcast called Earth Ancients. And right. uh, yeah, yeah. I, I heard John there and was uh, really interested in what, you know, research you've done and the, the books that you've written. I've actually got your book, uh, the, the Martian Enigma on the way. I actually ordered that today. So I'm excited to get that in the mail and start reading it. Um, so if I'm not mistaken, uh, you, you've actually written a bit called uh, a book called Before Atlantis recently. Um, right. Tell us a little bit about Before Atlantis. I haven't gotten into it very much. Right. So, uh, yeah, let me, uh, I'm going to flash it. Okay. Shameless self promotion. <laughs> um, <laughs> it's, uh, you can get it on Amazon. And um, it's, um, it's a new direction for me. Um, my, uh, you mentioned the Martian Enigmas, and um, I, uh, I was involved with, um, was called the independent mars investigation back in the 90s late 80s and 90s and um I, I i i wrote a bunch of papers a couple of books i did a lot of research related to the face on mars um it's uh i don't know is is, is i don't know if this is something that you know much about but um back you know uh, when i was getting started in, in my profession it was one of these things that was um it wasn't my job but i was able to actually apply a lot of the uh, a lot of the knowledge that I had, a lot of the uh, algorithms and techniques that I was developing for my day job to analyzing the face, right. which um, uh, was, uh, it is a remarkable formation. Um, it's, uh, uh, I don't know if you're, if you're familiar with it, but it. I'm, I'm a little bit familiar, you know, to be honest, I haven't looked um, a ton into it recently, maybe, you know, four or five years ago, I kind of fell down like a deep rabbit hole of you know, uh, you know, conspiracies and, and stuff like yeah. that. So I kind of fell into a little bit of a, a not very good place. Um, and so I kind of looked into it then, but I kind of brushed it off once I kind of worked myself out of that, that rabbit hole that I was in. And I haven't really looked into it much lately until I heard about you and the amount of research that you've done on it uh, to corroborate it. So do you yeah. think that, um, that there's actually like maybe an ancient civilization of some sort on mars or anything of that matter well i i think there's uh there's at least one landform we want to call it a landform to be you know a little bit more neutral mm -hmm. um i think it was a pre-existing uh landform on mars that was uh altered to give it a face-like appearance um okay. do i believe there's a civilization or there was a civilization on mars i don't think so i i don't think mars was um habitable uh long enough early in its history it had water and and uh, more of an atmosphere which it you know gradually lost over time um and probably didn't last long enough for uh you know an actual civilization to well for life advance well perhaps not even primitive life but because right. they haven't really right. found anything yet on mars right they've been looking right. and they really haven't found anything um, not to say that they won't. I mean, maybe once they start looking underground, because uh, there's likely a lot of water underground, um, they, you know, they may find some uh, some uh, present day life, but they haven't found anything so far. And I, I think probably, and I think uh, the uh, planetary science community is in agreement that you know Mars wasn't um, habitable uh, long enough for anything that could we could call a civilization to develop something that would be capable of, of constructing objects like the face. This is, you know, this is a structure, <coughs> excuse me, that's a mile long. So, you know, wow. we, we talk about me megalithic construction on earth, which is, you know, uh, 10 times smaller in, in yeah. scale. Right, right. So this is enormous. Um, I, I think it's I think it's a real formation. I, I think it's I think it's artificially created. Um, that's kind of what I uh, did in the night, <clears throat> excuse me, in the 90s. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, you read about in Martian enigmas and there's actually some uh, some posts uh, on before Atlantis 
that uh, you may want to check out, your listeners may want to check out uh, that <clears throat> relate to Mars. Sorry, I'm, I'm a little, I think oh, I'm here. Right, right here. Right. Um, <laughs> Let's so, just have another sip. <laughs> you're all right. No problem. Yeah. Um, so do you think that, uh, so I guess I would assume that you think Atlantis was a, a real civilization at one point. Am I correct on that? So, um, you know, I don't, I don't know, but it's such a loaded um, term. I agree. that it you know it drives mainstream scientists crazy they don't even you know if you if you have anything to do with that word <laughs> they don't want to have anything yeah, to do with you definitely. um and you know it's sort of it's 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 become a catch-all in the alternative um archaeological uh community which is you know it's a growing group of of people some serious some not so uh but, you know, I consider myself a serious researcher that's trying to understand what came before our present civilization, because there's there's enough uh, indication out there that there's there had to have been something else. There had to have been, you know, some call it a mother civilization, uh, a, a, a common origin of of culture, of languages, of, of megalithic uh, technology. Mm -hmm. And uh, and so, you know, if you want to call that Atlantis, fine. But it wasn't, I don't think it was a, a, a specific time and a place. I think it was that period that came before our, our okay. present age. And so in before Atlantis, I actually, you know, I don't know, I admit, I don't know about Atlantis. So it's like, okay, let's put that aside and let's talk about before Atlantis. Sure. sure. And that confuses some people. It's like, wait, you're making it a little hard. You're making it a lot harder. Right. But I, think in doing this you you open it up to okay let's look around the world and see what we find so we're not just looking for plato's you know prototypical circular you know cities uh, you know circles within circles this um this shape that people have found in all parts of the world and they say okay because i found this i found atlantis mm -hmm. i think we're looking for something that's much uh much broader in scope okay so do you think that Plato was correct in his uh, descriptions of Atlantis and like Timaeus and Critias? Do you, do you think that it was an accurate description? I, 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 think, I think there's elements in general, I think there's elements of, of certainly of, of Plato, uh, probably much of it is, is, is accurate, is factual. Uh, and I also think there's elements of, uh, of myth that can also be interpreted or, or interpreted in a certain context that will also sort of inform us, give us, help us to fill in the gaps. You know, I think between science and, and legend, I think we, we might have uh, enough sources in some cases to maybe come up with some tentative uh, conclusions. And that, that's sort of what I've done in, in Before Atlantis. Um, for example, in, in Mexico, there's the legend of the five suns, a legend of five world ages. We're in the fifth okay. age. And um, okay. I've heard of that one. and so and so what I do is in, in uh, when I talk about Mexico uh, and Central America and structures there, I'm able to actually relate the um, alignments of these structures to what I believe were previous locations of the North Pole. So we're getting into a little <laughs> different discussion now. What that's based on is uh, uh, a theory uh, proposed by Charles Hapgood in the 1950s. Okay. That Earth's crust has shifted uh, uh, for, and, and the reasons or causes are still unknown. Um, but he used that model as uh, as an explanation for climate change. That you could explain ice ages and periods of glaciation and thawing in different parts of the world and certain patterns as shifts of the crust, because when the crust shifts. What was the North Pole now moves to a temperate zone, and what was in a temperate zone moves to a polar region. Gotcha. And what I was able to do in Before Atlantis was correlate the alignments of structures that today are not aligned, you know, north, south, east, and west. A lot are, like the pyramids are yeah. oriented with very high precision. But if you look in Mexico, most of the structures in Mexico are not aligned to the cardinal directions. You know, why is that? Um, it, it was it because they 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 didn't they didn't care, they yeah, you know they, they right. it, but it turns out there are patterns and so okay what is that pattern so it turns out that pattern is correlated with half goods you know, hypothesized pole locations so if the North Pole were in this location climate would have been such and 
uh, sites, uh, uh, yeah, civilization, had it existed at that point, might have built uh, their structures aligned to that pole. And sure enough, we find this. We find evidence of this not only in Mexico, but in South America, in Europe, in Asia, in uh, Northern Africa, uh, throughout the world. Interesting, really interesting. So I've, um, wow, that's, that's really crazy because uh, kind of going off the correlation type of thing, it kind of makes me think about the Orion correlation theory. And uh, I just had uh, Larry Paul on, who's the director of the American Institute of Pyramid Research. I had him on um, a little while ago and I talked to him about um, the Orion correlation theory. So um, can, you, can you tell me a little bit about that? Like, does that maybe uh, have something to do with this, uh, this space on Mars or maybe in, in correlation with other structures in the world? Boy, what a perfect question. That, that was, that, that you couldn't have asked a better question. Um, so be, uh, I have, actually I have my uh, website up ahead of me. I just posted this article today. So this timing, uh, okay. timing of this interview is really uh, <laughs> quite perfect. Um, before Atlantis.com. Uh, I just posted an article as above, so as as below, so above. New evidence of an ancient connection between mm -hmm. Earth and Mars, and this is sort of part two uh, of a previous article I wrote. And all these articles are sort of they're they're they're, they're I use the book sort of as a point of departure. It's a starting point, and over the last couple of years, I've been adding to the research and publishing it online. Okay. So the article before this actually looked at. The Orion correlation theory, and uh, that was uh, you know that that was sort of examining this hermetic uh, concept of as above so below, and you know what uh, Robert Baval uh, proposed back in the late seventies was that the three stars um, in uh, in Orion were correlated with the three pyramids in Giza right, because they're right. they're not right they're not perfectly aligned, right, and so I test. I test that correlation. I test uh, a number of other ones because there's been other um, suggestions made. Other, it's been suggested that, for example, uh, the um, the structures at Teotihuacan in Mexico are also aligned to Orion. There's been uh, proposals that uh, the layout of the temples in Angkor in Cambodia, Angkor, Angkor Wat, and other uh, temples are in the pattern of the constellations, for example, the constellation Draco. Yeah, yeah. That and so another question is that I, I've read a little bit about the, the Angkor correlation on your website, and that's something completely new to me. So I was, I was going to bring that up. Yeah, and, and, uh, and a researcher uh, by the name of Wayne Herschel wrote a book, The Hidden Records, and he uh, actually does, uh, it's, it's all about what he calls star maps, what you know, he believes are, uh, uh, are sites on Earth that are laid out to mimic patterns of, 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 of not just stars, but constellations, and actually in some cases, extended portions of the sky, uh, you know, numerous constellations. For example, the west uh, bank of the Nile, they're all the pyramids that we find, um, you know, Giza and north and south um, of, of there, there's numerous sites, and he correlates these with a number of constellations, including Orion, which is what you brought up. Yeah. So there's definitely there's definitely some evidence um, that uh, the ancients built sites that reflected the heavens, built you know laid out structures um, that that in some way reflected parts of the heavens for whatever reason. And it and and interestingly enough, I live in the Northeast, um, mm -hmm. and in uh, New York State, there's a place called Overlook Mountain, and there's a very good correlation there with also with Draco, it's it's a, a native site, thought to be a native site. So the constructions are not, you know, they're not uh, uh, buildings with cut stones. They're 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 stone piles. They're, they're cairns, and and uh, and uh, serpentine formations and things like that. Things that the native people built. Yeah. Also, apparently, you know, referencing um, Draco, because way back when, depending on how far back you go, if you go back, you know, three thousand BC, Draco was the pole star. Right. Yes, I, I, I was. Uh, I was aware of that one. Yeah. Well, uh, Thuban. I mean, Thuban in, in the constellation Draco is a pole yeah. star. Yeah. Um, That's so, really interesting. Wow. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Because I'm. I'm in. Um, I'm in Michigan. I'm in Southeast Michigan, and uh, there's there's a place near me uh, called uh, Serpent Mound in Ohio. Right. Uh, 
it's interesting because that's in the shape of like a dragon or of some sort and that was built by native americans so uh, do you think i don't know maybe that that has something to do because what's interesting about serpent mount is that it lines up with the summer solstice on on june 22nd it lines up perfectly with it and uh, it actually kind of yeah. brings me to my next couple questions is uh i i heard you mention well i watched you mention graham hancock a little bit on your website and um do you do you believe in like the the younger Dryas impact hypothesis that he, that he's kind of um, pushing, or uh, do you think that maybe it's something different? Um, you know, I, I think I think there are. Um, I mean, he's he's looking at sort of the latest um, the the latest sort of cataclysm, if you will, the latest thing that was 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 earth changing was global. I guess actually the pandemic is the probably the most recent. But yeah, before yeah. that, when you think about it, you know, not too many things have have affected the planet. Uh, but that that would have, and um, and 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 it, and it explains a lot. Um, and so um, there's definitely, uh, I, you know, I I, I I definitely agree with with the uh, with the idea that it that it would have changed a lot of things and. I, I'm not sure that it would have brought about the downfall of a previous civilization. I think, um, mm -hmm. and, and, and you know, where I, where I go with it before Atlantis is it wasn't just one previous civilization that ended, but, but Earth has been host to countless civilizations that go yeah, back right. hundreds of thousands of years. And this actually eventually, we'll talk about a, a little bit, um, maybe we'll get us back to Mars, uh, some some new yeah. some more recent ideas, but um, so you know I think younger Dryas uh, or the pole shift that Hapgood talks about uh, from you know prior to our current pole, he believed that the previous location of the North Pole was in Hudson Bay, and when that pole shifted, uh, it brought about the end of the Ice Age in North America, yeah. and there would it would have been cataclysmic. And, and uh, you know, it, my contention in Before Atlantis is th that was the end of that civilization that we associate, in, at least in the West with Atlantis, but it was a worldwide change. Um, but it wasn't, it wasn't the only one. There were previous, uh, you know, at least uh, based on site alignments um, and what I've been able to analyze in the book, at least three other um, ages. And these line up with the, you know, I talked about the five sons um, yeah. legend. These line up with the five sons in, in uh, Mesoamerican, um, uh, in the Mesoamerican culture. So, um, so yeah, I, you know, I, I think younger Dryas uh, could have been, you know, uh, you know, earth changing uh, in a significant way, but I don't think it was the only one. Okay, interesting. Um, I. So I guess, um, so as you said earlier, you're, you're not quite sure if there was some sort of civilization on Mars, am I correct? Or just, you're not sure as to who possibly could have um, made that face, if anybody? Um, so, um, yeah, what, what, what do we know about the face on Mars? Right yeah. now, not a lot because we, ha we haven't been there. Right, right. But we we know, uh, and, and based on uh, analysis, and just based on just visually looking at dozens of images, so it's not you know originally NASA said that it was a trick of light and shadow, and they said that right. yeah, a yeah. second image taken a few days later, the the you know the uh, impression of a face went away. Well, that's that's not true, and a lot of other things they've said uh, are are also not true. Okay. Um, so we know that there's there's a landform that it, it's it's not a smiley face, it's not a cartoonish figure, it's it's sophisticated. It has humanoid proportions. So we know that. We also know that it, it appears to be purposely aligned in a certain direction. And there are near, nearby structures, if we want to call them structures or features, that also seem to share the same alignment, the same alignment direction. Okay. Um, and um, and what I was able to discover uh, more recently is, and this actually goes back to this other um, writer, other investigator I mentioned, Wayne Herschel. He, he proposed a number of star maps and uh, they were not only on earth, but one was on Mars. 
And he proposed that the city that's southwest of the, of the face was uh, a ground representation of the Pleiades. Oh, okay. As he, you know, he, there's several other sites, uh, several other examples on earth that he claims are, are representations of the Pleiades. And uh, the one on Mars is intriguing because it, it turns in, when I actually did the analysis that I talk about in this article, it actually correlates with the Pleiades better than uh, some of the terrestrial sites that I looked at in, in a previous posting. Um, so that, like I said, there were two postings talking about correlations. And, and so I found, you know, I kind of found that remarkable that, um, that it, would, it, it would mimic that pattern so well. What's interesting about it is when you say, okay, now we've got this pattern on the ground that matches the Pleiades. So there's kind of a, like a connection, right? Mathematical sort of relationship. Let's go to the face. What does the face correspond to in the heavens and in, in, the, in the sky? And, and Wayne Herschel uh, you know, considers this idea and, and he finds that there's actually no star. There's nothing there right now. And he, he hypothesized that there might've been a star in the past you know, because stars stellar, there is still stellar motion. Things are yeah. moving around and over thousands, you know, tens of thousands of years, right. things move. Um, but I consider another possibility. That other possibility is that that point in the sky that the face appears to reference is less than two degrees from what's called the ecliptic. This is the path that the sun and, and you know, if you're, okay, if you're on, on earth, mm -hmm. you look at the sky, there's the sun. And you know, when the sun sets along that same line, the sun is moving, you know, Venus will rise or Mars or Jupiter. You see the planets right. moving along that because they're all in the solar system. They're all moving yeah. the same, roughly the same plane. On Mars, uh, you'll see earth. And uh, what Richard Hoagland uh, determined back in the 70s and 80s, actually the 80s, uh, was that the face appears to be aligned in the summer solstice direction. In other words, if the sun, you know, the, on the first day of summer, the sun rises on Mars. Right. It rises in the northeast direction. It's in the northern hemisphere. And that direction appeared to be roughly lined up with the face in the city. Uh, he measured an angle, and based on that angle, he determined that the last time it was aligned perfectly was about a half a million years ago. Uh, okay. And that's because in, what he used is a method that we, that, that archae, archae astronomers use when they're trying to date a site based on an alignment, like a solstice alignment, like, like Stonehenge, for example. If right. you go to the center of Stonehenge and you look out at the heel stone, I believe it is, the sun doesn't rise exactly at that point. It's shifted a little bit. And it's because Earth's tilt has changed, its obliquity. Same thing is true on Mars. So he used that, uh, that, that um, a model of Mars, uh, Mars's obliquity change to say that, okay, half a million years ago, this alignment would have been exact. Wow. So this was, and, and you know, this was really, a really cool idea, but there was really no way of testing it. Right. So what I do in this paper now is I've, by, by finding that, you know, going back, it's a little, little complicated, but now, you know, going back to the uh, Pleiades and, you know, if they correlate with the city and the face correlates with this location in the sky, it turns out that 290,000 years ago, so not a half a million, but 290,000 years ago, yep. the ecliptic passed through that point. So if we take that now and use that to drive the alignment you know, and say, okay, how would things have had to have been aligned for that to lock in on the ground? So two things to sort of align, to, to sort of lock in with each other, it's 290,000 years, not a half a million. Gotcha. And, and what this says now is that we have, we have a set of alignments on Mars that, um, reference not just the sun, not just the rising of the sun on the summer solstice, but every body in our, in principle, every body in our solar system, because every, you know, every planet will move and, you know, will, will appear to rise at that, some, that point, at some point in time, um, or at some time of the year, let's say. Um, and, and so you have that, so you have uh, the reference of, of the Cydonia region to the solar system. And you have the, the fact that now you have this, um, 
this, uh, this humanite, humanoid form that is aligned in this direction. And the only body in the solar system that we know of that hosts a humanoid species is Earth. So it makes a very strong case that this site references Earth and references humankind. Yeah. And the fact that it occurs so long ago, 290,000 years ago, or let's you know say hundreds of thousands of years ago, it's not 10,000 years. So it's not, yeah. it's well beyond the horizon of current archeology. span yeah. It's not billions of years ago. It's not like planetary. Right. It's something in between now. And that makes it very interesting. Definitely. Yeah, that's, that's really interesting. I mean, do so, have you presented any of this to, I guess, you could, uh, modern academia? I mean, are you labeled as a pseudoscientist or anything like that? Oh, by yeah. anybody? Oh, of course. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, what would, uh, I mean, what would be the point of this correlation? Like why, um, I guess, why should, why should we, I guess in layman's terms, why should we care about the alignment? Well, so, you know, why do we do what we do? Um, some of us have this passion to to um, to to know our origins. You know, Definitely. where did we come from? Um, you know, how old is our civilization? You know, because the past informs the future. And um, there are just some of us. That's part, that's our DNA. That this is what we we're interested in. Other people are interested in, you know, in other things, um, countless other things. Yeah. Uh, and it's all fine, but this is sort of what drives us. Uh, those of us that are doing this generally uh, have other, other uh, have professions. I mean, this is, uh, you know, some people would call this my hobby. Uh, my daughter calls it my side hustle <laughs> <laughs> because, you know, it's sort of something I, I do on the side yeah. that is, is actually, it's become my passion um, because um, it's, there you know, it, there, there, are, there are fundamental questions that have to be answered. They're not going to be answered by mainstream science. Mainstream science just goes so far. They, they have this box, this paradigm, this, this set of problems that they're interested in solving. And anything outside of that, they ignore. Or, they, or if they're pressed on it, they will ridicule it. They will say, that's pseudoscience. You know, and that's fine. I understand it. They're, they're getting paid by universities, governments, you know, they're you know, whatever to, 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 to sort of toe the party line. And I get it. Um, but there's nothing scientific or objective about it. It's just they, they're operating under, a, under their own belief system. Those of us that are doing, uh, you know, alternative archaeology or pseudoscience, if, if you will, I mean, they, you know, the, the mainstream, it's kind of funny. I think the mainstream community, mainstream scientific community is pretty much mapped out. Not only are all the fields of science mapped out, you know, you know, biology and all the subdivisions of biology and geology and physical sciences, but I think they've also pretty much mapped out uh, pseudoscience as well. <laughs> and so I'm not exactly sure where they put this, but, yeah. you know, I think if there's an, in the, the, the answer we're looking for is, is the answer that explains, you know, life on earth, the origin of life on earth, civilizations, uh, planetary anomalies, uh, and ultimately, you know, what are we facing nowadays? We're facing this U UAP phenomena. Um, yeah. And, yeah. and so, you know, I think the answer's got to be really broad. And, th and this is kind of where I'm going now and a number of others. And uh, I think by finding some of these, some of these correlations, some of these connections, um, there, there are sort of clues. And I don't claim to have the answer. I, I'll have a, uh, you know, set of hypotheses of things, uh, you know, some ideas that, um, that kind of motivate me that sort of drive me to do the you know, sort of like look into the next thing. But I'm really interested in just un uncovering more facts that are derived from other facts. You know, I'm not here speculating or, you know, making up stuff. I'm actually looking at data and seeing what correlates and what, you know, what can, what can we, uh, you know, derive from, from that. Exactly. Yeah. And I mean, that, that seems to be the case. Like I've talked to, you know, you and I've talked to Larry Paul and I talked to Brian Forrester and, um, you know, all you guys seem to have really strong evidence for what 
you're presenting, but modern academia doesn't seem to want to accept the evidence because of whatever reason. And it's, uh, you know, it's, it's disheartening and uh, kind of dishonest, you know, because for me, myself, I want to know as many true things and as few false things as possible. And what you guys are presenting to me is better evidence than I think uh, a school textbook ever taught me. Um, I, I think there's more evidence behind a theory of a possible lost civilization or um, an extraterrestrial civilization, which I guess that kind of leads me into my next question. Do you think that these UAPs are extraterrestrial? No, I don't. Okay. So what's uh, do you think that maybe they're, you know, like government made or something like that? No, I don't think the government made either. I think it's, I think it's none of the above. Okay. Um, you know, let me, I'll, I'll, I'll answer this question, but I just want to say, you know, what, what happens, I think science, the way they have so um, institutionalized certain ideas, uh, I, I think they've taken the passion out. Uh, you know, I, I think a lot of people are really interested in this. And I think an interest in, in these, you know, these really broad sort of fundamental ideas um, are what gets, they, I think it gets people interested in science and in, in different disciplines. And, you know, we, we talk about how, you know, we're not innovating. Well, we're not innovating because, you know, we're, we're, intellectually, we, we, we've become very stagnant. Yes. And, and I think, you know, th there needs to be more freedom of thought, uh, more uh, openness to, to speculation, informed speculation. I mean, if you're going to suggest, uh, uh, propose something, well, what's your evidence? And, you know, you can't just be dismissed based on subject matter alone. By, by labeling it, oh, that's pseudoscience. So that's, oh, that's that, that face on Mars that NASA proved was fake. Well, no, they never did. They never did that. You can't prove it. You can't prove it's fake. <laughs> we may one day go there and dig it uh, and excavate and find, yeah, there's absolutely nothing there. Right. And we, we may be able to determine in the future that there's pretty good evidence that it's just a funny looking rock formation, but we're not there yet. Definitely. Um, in any case, I think, you know, what, what I do in Before Atlantis is, is I actually assume, I, I sort of take the whole ancient astronaut, um, uh, you know, sort of starting uh, assumptions away. Because, you know, like on a lot of shows, you know, if, 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 you, if you assume that there's extraterrestrials, then, you know, everything has an extra, has, then everything is caused by extraterrestrials. Right. We don't understand this. It's extraterrestrial. So you don't understand that. You know, everything has that answer. So what I wanted to do in Before Atlantis was sort of take that away. Let's and I, my assumption was, let's assume that that there's been previous civilizations, and you know, look, we're discovering all these new um, uh, subspecies, these uh, hu hu uh, uh, human subspecies like uh, Denisovans, yeah. and um, and even you know, Neanderthals are are you know they were they were they they were not mindless brutes they were sophisticated uh so what what could these civilizations or or these these earlier species have accomplished and so where i go with in before atlantis is i assume just purely indigenous no external um you know uh, no aliens or anything like that and i try to take it as far as i can go based on alignments and you know what, what information we have our you know archaeological information to sort of uh, push that idea and see what we can get out of it um, my my uh, a few months ago I released released another book called uh, not of this world and it's about the UA UAP and UFO uh, uh, phenomena and um, and I take the opposite well I, I don't necessarily take it but my conclusion is quite the opposite that like, you know, we were talking before, are UAPs extraterrestrial? I don't think so. Are they government? I don't think so. I think there's something else. I, you know, I think, I think it's a very complicated, I think the, the, the UFO phenomenon is complicated. I think, I think in some cases there could be some reverse engineered technology out there. Uh, I'm open to that. I'm also open to the possibility of some 
extraterrestrial civilizations. But, you know, you listen to the SETI scientists and they say, well, there's trillions and trillions of, 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 of planets with life out there. Mm -hmm. That's the case. Why don't we have any radio signals? Why haven't we detected any artifacts? You know? Right. Um, but yet we've had, you know, uh, this, this growing, uh, it seems, phenomenon of, of uh, unidentified flying objects and uh, unidentified aerial phenomenon. And it's and you can trace it back over thousands of years, biblical times. And, and so, you know, I think it's complicated. I think there's a lot of things going on, but I think there's definitely a component of it that cannot be explained by any physical cause. And I think, I think, um, yeah, I was, you know, it was Jacques Vallée who proposed the idea that UFOs could be interdimensional. Yeah. And I think they're, I think they're coming from um, another plane of existence. Not, you know, we talk about the physical universe. I, you know, so in, in, in the theory of, um, you know, which is believed uh, is, you know, if you're a believer in esoteric traditions, spiritual tra traditions, um, the universe isn't just the physical universe that, uh, in which life evolved from lifeless matter and consciousness developed from, from life. But in emanation, uh, in the beginning, it was just consciousness, and the and creation was the unfolding of planes of, of, of universes. The physical universe is the coarsest; it's the grossest, the one that we live in has the least amount of consciousness. But there are higher planes, and um, and I believe that you know that this is where this phenomenon originates, and it enters our space, and it uh, it exits it much the same way. You could sort of use the analogy of of you know having a if this is our world and then this is this is a broader universe as things enter and leave it they appear they disappear they exhibit all kinds of strange behaviors we can't explain using our physical models they're not sufficient and that's yeah. what i that's kind of what i believe is going on okay yeah that's that's a theory that i've i've actually me and my wife were just talking about this the other day we were, we were talking you know what if they are just skipping through dimensions and they just you know they just so happen to stop in for just a second before they're you know on their merry way um, yeah one thing that i kind of have theorized is you know a lot of these uap videos that are coming out lately like they, they seem to all be over the water um so and mm. like a lot of these U, ufos and uaps are going down into the water disappearing into the water so i you know my theory is maybe there's some sort of underwater civilization because i mean if i if i'm not mistaken we haven't really explored very much of our oceans at all um yeah so, so i feel like it's you know i don't know maybe, maybe there's something under the water that you know we, we haven't discovered it's it's kind of out there but um I, I don't know i just think it's weird that they're all over the water <laughs> no that but, that that's that's a really that's a really good point and you know uh, people have suggested um I mean, there's a whole range of of of, um, of scenarios. They they you know they could be hiding in the in the oceans, they could be hiding on the far side of the moon or in the moon or yeah. you know. Then there was the report of the Israeli um, the ex uh, military official who talked about you know meeting with aliens uh, in an underground base on Mars. Mm -hmm. So I mean, you know, so maybe they're hiding you know you know underground on, on Mars. Uh, I don't know. Yeah. You know, it's um, even, even if that were the case, what we're seeing in these, in these uh, videos, these UAP videos that, you know, the three that the government, the uh, U.S. Navy released last year, and that's, there's been a few others, the Chilean, Chilean uh, Navy released uh, a, a video and Department of Homeland's Land Security released a video. So I think there's at least five out there, plus the new one with the triangle that you've seen probably. Right, right. That, that I think could be, that, that, that I think could be a reverse engineered, uh, you know, alien technology yeah. or human technology. Right. But the, the Tic Tacs that the Navy pilots talk about, yes. there's no way that's, that's uh, terrestrial technology because you yeah. can't move the physics of and the the effect of that kind of movement acceleration on a on an organism or even on a piece of machinery would be devastating like yeah. a, a thousand g's yeah i mean like commander fravor you know i just watched a 60 minutes thing with him yesterday he said that this thing dropped 80,000 feet in one second so i mean that's yeah. 
incredible. It's incredibly fast. I can't, I can't even fathom it, but uh, yeah, it's, it's just interesting to think about. And I mean, I'm interested to see what comes out in the future. And um, well, what's kind of interested me about like the reverse engineering thing is, I don't know if you're familiar with Bob Lazar, um, but uh, he, he was, he said at one point that one vehicle that he's worked on in S4 and Area 51 was an archeological find. Um, mm. He hasn't really elaborated on that at all. Um, but do you think that that's possible or plausible, I guess, that we found a UFO and, and just somehow haven't, you know, said anything about it to anybody? I mean, do you think that the government's maybe hiding UFOs? Facebook is great because someone just uh, <laughs> sent, sent something to me on, on Facebook yesterday. It was about a, um, I think it's called the Baltic Sea Anomaly. It's, it's, it, it looks like a, a, a giant UFO under the Baltic Sea, apparently. Like mm-hmm. if you go travel over it, your you know, electronic equipment stops working. And uh, I mean, it's, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I think, I think all these things are possible. Um, and, and I think what makes the whole uh, investigation complicated is that there, there, there could be more than one thing going on. And, uh, and so, you know, and, and then plus, um, you know, then, then with, with scientists conflating, you know, different ideas and information, it makes, and, and there's also kind of, you know, the, the whole, you know, giggle factor, you know, you, and, and you mentioned the 60 Minutes interview. I think a lot of UFO investigators are getting a little impatient with, with the media. They're just, they, they're, yeah. like, it's like they're, they're, they're in the, in the Stone Age. It's like, yeah, this yeah. stuff is real. You know, get over it. It's real. Yeah. You know, I mean, like these people are still, like, you know, the news anchors are still, you know, saying, let's put on our tinfoil hats for our next guest and, you know, stuff like that. And it's like, come on, guys, you know, it's, uh, it's just, and it, that seems to be like how modern academia acts like with ancient, possible ancient lost high technology and evidence of that is they kind of tend to, oh, here, where's our tinfoil hats? Atlantis, you know, and uh, it's just dishonest. You know, I, I wish that people were more open to, to honest evidence. I mean, it's not like there's people that, that have lost their jobs over over presenting stuff like this. And uh, so it's like, why why would people you know, basically sacrifice their whole life for, for something that that's, they don't have evidence to support, you know? Right. Right. Um, I mean, yeah. I mean, you know, they say, they say, well, it's, you know, someone's trying to make a buck. Well, you don't, you don't make a lot of money, you know, Hancock and, uh, and Baval, these guys, they're, they're the best selling authors. Yeah. And, um, you know, they, I'm sure they do quite well, but they don't, they don't do as well as, you know, your, your, your top 10, you know, New York Times bestsellers exactly. or people writing, you know, cranking out all this, all this mindless fiction. Yeah. Um, there's other ways of making a lot of money writing and, and I, doing what they're doing there. It's not, they're not doing it for the money. Um, Absolutely. But, you know, it, it, it's fine. You know, I, some people get sort of angry and frustrated. Um, I, if, if they don't, if they don't want to work on it, fine. It's a free country. You know, we're, we're, those of us that are doing it um, with, you know, there's some really in, incredibly enabling technologies, you know, the internet and, and computing power and, you know, in it, even, you know, Zooms being able to talk like this, you know, yeah. I, I talk much more with colleagues now via Zoom since the pandemic. It's kind of ironic. Yeah, it's crazy. And this is, this is all good. Absolutely. I mean, I definitely think that we're on some sort of a, a cusp of of a change Mm. you know i for sure because i'm seeing things you know come out um you know like graham hancock is getting his name out there a lot more and like he's getting people like randall carlson and dr robert shock and um you know it's people like joe rogan promoting him there's people that that are getting behind theories like this so i and like myself you know i came across people like brian forrester and graham hancock and that was just totally enthralled with what they had to say and now I can't stop I'm <laughs> and then I come across people like you and like I you know I need to talk to you guys and, and get your guys' thoughts on this because and get your message out because maybe there's someone in my audience that doesn't know about your research and this is you know 
you know, maybe they're, they're someone bigger than me that can <laughs> spread the message. I don't know, but yeah, I mean, in, in, I think, you know, I feel like I'm doing that in my own way. I, I don't have all the answers. I'm just trying to do what I do. Uh, and then you get it out there and then people see it and, you, you know, you're communicating it, others communicating it and they put put things together and maybe come up with something else. And absolutely. It's uh, it's what it's all about. Absolutely. I totally I totally agree. But um, but one I won't keep you for too much longer, but. One thing I had to ask is because I watched some of your YouTube videos before uh, earlier this morning. And if I'm not mistaken, are you a musician? Because I also see piano in the background there. Yeah, I was going to say we should we should jam. I was about to say, because, you know, I got my guitar and stuff hanging out behind me. Uh, what do you, So what do you play? Tell me a little bit about your music experience. I, I am a frustrated musician. Okay. Uh, my you know, I, I when I was young, I was really good in science. Uh, I never had to study. I just loved it. I was passionate about it. it was rockets. I love you know, I grew up during Apollo yeah. during the 60s. And um, but then as I got older, I got interested in music. I, you know, was I was a drummer at the time, played in a rock band and I wanted to, you know, I wanted to major in music, be a musician. Mm -hmm. My dad talked me out of it. He said, you know, he said, drummers are a dime a dozen. You know, you'll, you know, you're, you're not, you're not, it's going to be really hard to make a living. He said, go to college, you know, major in, in science and you can do it on the side. Yeah. And, and I'm, I'm really glad, I'm, I'm glad because there are the, the, the talent out there, um, to, you know, so much more so now, I can't believe the, the level of musicianship, not just, to, yeah. I used to think it was just technical, but as I listen to more and more musicians, there's some just incredible stuff out there. Um, yeah. I, I, I so enjoy it. And I, and I, uh, you know, I do what I can. I, now I play piano and I still play drums and percussion. Interesting. Um, yeah. And it's, uh, you know, whenever it's, it's, it's hard because I, I have a day job and, right. and I, and I do, you know, I have this, this side hustle here yeah. and then I have music and it's like, you know, and we have grandkids and it's like, yeah. well, wait, and, and, you know, it's like, my wife is like, well, okay, what, are we going to do something today? It's like, oh yeah. <laughs> that's, that's exactly where I'm at. Cause you know, I do this, I'm, I'm a musician and, you know, I, I sing and I play guitar and I, I kind of like this, the computer is actually sitting on my piano right now. And you know, so <laughs> I kind of fiddle with, with a couple instruments and I've got like my own original music out and stuff, but Cool. And then I started doing this podcast and um, I'm on a bunch of other podcasts all the time. I'm always, I like to press practice street epistemology and, you know, read on religion and talk to people about their religious beliefs. And my wife is like, so are we going to go out to dinner or, you know, what's going on? And I'm like, Oh, shit. you know, I've got an interview set up today. <laughs> Sorry. But um, yeah, well, we should be grateful because we're never going to, we're never going to be bored. There's, exactly. always, there's always something to do. Exactly. Because I mean, also I work full time and I work 40 plus hours a week, you know, as a grocery store manager. So it's like, you know, my hands are, are full and I hate being bored. And that was the thing is I was coming home and I was reading Graham Hancock and I was like, you know, what the heck am I doing? I'm reading Graham Hancock and just playing a couple chords on guitar. I need to do something. So I went out and I made my own original song. And then I went out and I started a podcast, started talking to people like you and, um, yeah, it's it's uh it's definitely I got a couple side hustles going on, I guess you could say, but I guess uh whatever whatever makes you happy, I guess. But yeah, um, I won't keep you up for too much longer, Mark, but uh I appreciate you coming on. I had an awesome talk with you. I learned a lot about you, and you know, your book is on the way here. I'm gonna order before Atlantis too as soon as we get off the call because I need to take a look at that too. I got a lot of yes. reason to do it, so, I guess. So, so let me mention two websites before sure. Atlantis.com and not of this world ufo one word dot com and there's a lot of information i post stuff on there so yeah there's you know the books are there but there's also a lot of a lot of other information online and uh you know check it out absolutely i'll be sure to plug all your stuff in the description of the podcast uh it's going to be available on spotify i might put it on youtube we'll see what happens but uh but you'll be able to listen to it anywhere sometime in the next week or so but i appreciate you uh coming in today, Mark, and uh, I hope to talk to you again real soon. Sounds good, Cal. Take awesome. care. Talk All to right, you later. Bye -bye.